Welcome to Thursfield's Talk Legal, a vidcast series from one of the leading law firms in the Midlands. I'm Steve Dyson, a journalist who's talking to a range of solicitors here at Thursfield's on legal topics of wide interest to the public or businesses. Today's episode is all about how the COVID-19 pandemic has prevented commercial contracts from being fulfilled and how to cope with this in the legal world. Here to explain the subject is Stuart Price. Stuart's a director at Thursfield Sisters and is an expert on commercial contracts. Hello to you, Stuart. Hello, Steve. Uh, thanks for inviting me to take part today. No problems. Now, Stuart, we all know that COVID-19 has had huge impacts on almost every walk of life. One of the implications is that the resulting restrictions simply mean many planned events or activities can't happen seemingly contravening what must be millions of commercial contracts. Facing this scenario, the legal term force majeure is now trending. So let's start by explaining exactly what that phrase means. For starters, it's quite a misunderstood phrase. People seem to think force majeure is some kind of act of parliament or a law in itself. And in fact, it's not, certainly not under English law anyway. The the phrase comes from uh, the French, as you might expect, and they have their own recognised concept. But we don't. In England, the force majeure is simply a contractual term that may be written in a contract that enables a party affected by an event to suspend or defer delivery of goods or services for the period of time whilst the force majeure event continues. If there's no written contract between the parties containing a force majeure clause, there is no force majeure clause. It's simple as that. The uh, party affected by an incident has no right to suspend or defer performance. And if they do, they will be in breach of contract. There is also something called frustration, which is a common law provision. Now, frustration enables parties to be relieved from their obligations, but only if the contract becomes impossible to perform. That's a very rare occurrence. But let's go back to the force majeure clause just for a second. I obviously write these all the time when I'm writing commercial contracts, and they have the following provisions within them. They always have to set out what a force majeure event is, and um, whilst in the past people used to describe them as acts of God, we're a bit more prescriptive these days, so they will include things like epidemics and hopefully pandemics. They will include strikes, lockouts, illegality, government actions, etc. So you would normally find a whole list of them in a contract that would trigger uh, an event. You also look at the contract to find out whether or not it would exclude foreseeable events because a force majeure um, should really only be there for unforeseeable events because if it's foreseen, then the party should be making specific provision for that. There'll also be something to contract causation because just because an incident has arisen, it still needs to be linked to the inability of the supplier to supply or the party to perform. And there will also be a notice obligation there as well, telling the person affected by the force majeure that they've got to let the other party know as soon as possible. Um, If they've jumped through all those hoops, then the force majeure clause should allow them to suspend or default performance. uh, And in some cases, excuse performance uh, entirely and can also give the unaffected party uh, new termination rights. That's really interesting. So what happens then, Stuart? Um, If a party argues that the COVID-19 emergency has stopped a contract to the extent of it being impossible to deliver, for instance, the rule of six preventing a planned conference or a planned wedding reception, is that where force majeure is applicable? The first thing we have to look at, is there a written contract and is there a force majeure clause in that contract? Or is there some other clause that excuses a a party from um, having to perform in certain circumstances? If there is not, then we forget about force measure altogether, okay? We then have to move to frustration to decide whether or not the contract is impossible uh, to perform. In the Second World War, uh, suppliers were prohibited by government diktat from supplying Germany. As a result of that, lots of supply contracts were frustrated because of that government intervention. So we have a situation here where the rule of six, again, is another example of government intervention. But of course, it's not banned conferences in itself, has it? But it has restricted what can happen or how a conference can take place. 
So there's a discussion here that is, if there's a force majeure, and that includes government interaction, and that's caused to suspend the day, there may be an opportunity to suspend that or relieve a party from an obligation. But if there isn't a force majeure, we have to look at frustration. And there's an argument to say, well, the conference could still take place. It might be limited. Uh, maybe only six people can attend, or maybe that, uh, six people can be in a room, but you can have several rooms or several defined areas. It may be that the conference isn't going to be profitable anymore, but reduced profitability does not frustrate the contract. It doesn't mean that it's impossible to perform. So when faced with something like this, the parties can find themselves in some difficulty in working out what should happen next. This is why we often see um, hotels or events organisers uh, postponing events as opposed to cancelling, in other words, to, to, to say the contract still remains alive, but to reach an agreement that it goes off. And uh, if the customer is not available in that scenario, then they probably would then agree to vary the terms of the arrangement so that they, so they are allowed to cancel because it's probably in neither party's interest in that instance for that to happen. Um, there is a distinction between business to business contracts. So if you're a business one to put a conference on, uh, there's no obligation of the parties to necessarily act fairly with each other. The contract is the contract. But when you're dealing with the consumer, uh, there is an obligation to act fairly. So in that context, uh, if the conference couldn't take place or the person couldn't attend the conference, then there'd be a question about whether there should be a refund of uh, the fees paid. How far can force majeure stretch before the non-performance of a contract becomes illegal? And can, in those circumstances, the non-performing party be forced to pay damages? Yeah, well, as we said again, there has to be a force majeure clause. So we have to look at that force majeure clause. Force majeure clause. What does it say? Generally, a force majeure clause would say that if the period of force majeure cont continues beyond a certain period, the non-affected party will have a right to terminate that contract. Now, setting the period is always quite difficult when you're negotiating a contract because, of course, you don't know, if no, one, no one actually knows if, if an event is going to happen. Even if there's a pandemic, you don't necessarily know if the contract is ultimately going to be affected by it. And often people do contracts, uh, 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 agree to contracts on one or other party's standard terms. But that is where you would look. So if, say, for example, if the contract said if a period of force majeure continued for any more than four weeks, it would then give the non-affected party uh, a right to serve notice, say, another four weeks, to terminate for that base, on that basis. So that's kind of what we're talking about there, I think, is that you look at the force majeure clause to see what the parties had agreed and then you have to act in accordance with it. Gosh, there are obviously so many implications, Stuart. So let's go through a quick fire Q&A for a few of them. Um, can a party abandon or terminate a contract if COVID-19 makes it too hard or expensive to perform? Okay, well, the force majeure clause, if there is one, would give a right to suspend, defer, or possibly terminate, if that's what the clause says. Um, if there's no force majeure clause, then a failure to perform would be a breach of contract on the part of uh, the, per the party who um, is affected. Um, the innocent party in that context would be entitled to seek compensation for its losses, but uh, they need to be very careful because if, they, if, you, if that innocent party uh, terminates the contract illegally, they themselves give rise to, uh, or make themselves uh, subject to a damages claim. Remember that frustration, which is the other side of the coin, will only apply if the contract is impossible to perform. So therefore, difficult or uneconomic contracts, whilst not attractive, could still be performed, and therefore the concept of frustration doesn't apply. Anyone who wanted to terminate a contract then would need to review the termination provisions carefully. Sometimes there's a right to terminate for convenience, um, and sometimes there's actually a cancellation right too. It's all about going back to the original contract that you signed to see what your rights are under it. What about varying the contract or renegotiating its terms, Stuart? How can parties go about that? Can they go about that and how can they? Okay, well, contracts can be varied, but only uh, with the consent and agreement of both parties by, the, by its very nature. You often find in a written contract that there is a boilerplate clause, which are the standard clauses at the back of a commercial contract, which will say how a variation should be recorded. It will generally say it should be any variation should be in writing uh, and it should be signed by representatives of both of the parties uh, to be uh, valid. As for the act of uh, renegotiation itself, 
Well, this is going to depend very much on the parties' respective positions. And uh, again, you know, there will have to be a conversation, won't there, between all parties concerned. And some of the things they might like to consider as part of that renegotiation effectively is think about the long-term impact of any changes on the contract. Is this a contract where there should only be some short-term measures in place? In other words, uh, we agreed that you would deliver some goods on the 31st of October, but can we change that till to the 30th of November? for example, without affecting that. What well, happens if there's some increased costs arising? Who should bear the burden of those increased costs? Are there any consequences for the wider business, for example? Is, are there letters of credit, especially if there's international trade, or security given to banks, lenders, and things like that? Will they be affected by any deferment or suspension? So there's a number of issues there that the parties will need to try and get through. Stuart, if a business needs to ensure the continuation of contractual arrangements to prevent for instance, administration or bankruptcy, they're in trouble, they really need supply, for instance. What steps can they take to protect those supply chains using contract law? Well, again, it's, uh, the contract law is quite limited as far as this goes, and it's about, really, the, the, each of the participants in the subject chain having a conversation, trying to work out the issues. Sometimes, if you're the person not affected by the force measure, but you're, the supplier to you is, you may have to find an alternative supplier, particularly if your customer is not uh, prepared to negotiate um, a shorter period. Now, that does create contractual law issues because somebody could be in breach of contract uh, and there could be consequences flying from that. Uh, And these are issues that if the parties don't agree and sort them out, then the courts will have to intervene at some point, which could be uh, very messy. Supply chain needs to consult. These are often long-standing relationships the people in the chain know each other and they should have a conversation because you don't know you might think you're sitting there in the middle of a chain thinking we've got a problem but you don't know if the other people in the chain or further up the chain have got a problem and want to have a similar discussion too it's all about maintaining that um, that communication line in the worst cases Stuart, can the law compel a supplier to continue providing a service during covid19 for instance Okay, well, failure to perform your obligations under contract will be a breach of contract and expose you to a claim for damages. However, and this probably sounds a little uh, counterintuitive, as the remedy for breach of contract is damages, the law will not generally compel a supplier to continue to perform. The equitable remedy of specific performance, in other words, being ordered to or being ordered to be or be compelled, uh, is only available where damages are not an adequate remedy. And therefore, if damages are an adequate remedy, the court will be unlikely to make an order to a supplier to compel it to continue to perform. Now, that's the state, That's the standard position. Uh, that is varied slightly by a new Act of Parliament called the Corporate Governance and Insolvency Act, which actually provides for continuation of supply of goods and services, even in the event of a customer's uh, insolvency. And it's something that uh, insolvency practitioners, insolvency lawyers are trying to get their heads around because it's an Act of Parliament that's only been in for a few weeks. Uh, but that is an example of the, the government intervening in private contractual arrangements and effectively telling companies that they shouldn't be enforcing termination clauses and should be continuing to supply in certain circumstances. So that's quite an interesting um, area of law that will be developing, I'm sure, in, in the following weeks. Stuart, what if a business can't perform all of its contracts in full? How does it choose which ones to maintain? Well, the law doesn't help you here, uh, Steve, I'm afraid. Uh, the decision is entirely commercial and will involve um, you having to balance things like the relationship with your customers, uh, risk to the business, profitability, etc. Whenever this situation arises, I would always say to a client, pick up the phone. You don't know whether or not your customer is also struggling. Uh, they may not need their allocation of goods and services, and they might be prepared to receive a smaller delivery so perhaps they're looking for the opportunity too but if you're thinking about how you might prioritize contracts some thoughts on this might be well maybe you should look at the contracts that have got the harshest consequences for breach first of all uh, but clearly in terms of uh, for business protection but then you know what about what about moral imperative you know if you've got um uh, supply obligations to i don't know to provide ppe to the nhs maybe because the state of the country was in and may well be in again if the second wave hits. That is, should be more of a, 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 an imperative to your business. You should check to see if you've got any priority supply clauses in your contracts. Now, people who supply into the public sector 
or to large businesses may find that they are hidden in the small print somewhere. And maybe if you accept the fact that you're going to be in breach of contract, look at those contracts that have got lower liabilities for breach, uh, because those are ones that you might say, well, we're not going to breach those, but the risk or the consequences are less than they might have been for another contract where we might have unlimited liability. All I would always say is that if you're going to prioritise, be reasonable about it and make a record of that decision because you never know if you might have to justify those decisions before a judge one day. And the other thing is, is if you're thinking about this, your customers are too. So have that conversation earlier to give them an opportunity to make their own contingency plans too. It's been fascinating, Stuart, to explore the impact of COVID-19 on commercial contracts with you. And for those watching and listening, what are your top tips for companies who need to have their contracts fulfilled? Okay, well, as I found with certain customers of mine, of certain clients of mine, sorry, earlier on in the year, they were being faced with a face complete. In other words, their customers were saying, we don't need your products anymore, we don't need your services anymore. It's all because of the COVID. My, my advice to those uh, clients is just don't take that on face value. Obviously, I'm going to say take advice. Um, secondly, I'm also going to suggest that they consider the government guidance. In the, on the 7th of May, the Cabinet Office uh, produced a paper called Responsible Contractual Behaviour. Um, the, the last thing the government wanted to see and the courts want to see is everybody running to the High Court to use that as a mechanism to uh, resolve its disputes. Um, they want the parties to act reasonably together and to make allowances for any issues the COVID causes. So consider that guidance and remind other parties of that guidance if necessary. Having done that, look to see if there's a force majeure clause. Of course, if there isn't one, then remember the contract still capable of being performed or uh, still must be performed. If there is a, uh, so you can tell the other party, they've got to comply. Um, if there is a force measure clause, analyse it carefully. Make sure that the event is one of the listed events. Make sure that the um, notice has been given in the proper way. And also check to see if the two things, there's, there's, there's a, a cause and link between the two things, between the uh, pandemic and the failure supply, because often there isn't. It could just be being used as an excuse. So if you receive a notice from the other party, check the position very carefully, but reflect also. So acknowledge receiving the notice, reflect and analyse the clause. And if they are wrong, push back and say, you're not entitled to rely upon force measure for whatever the reasons are, and we require you to continue to supply. But you can start getting into some contentious areas there, so that's why I said at the beginning, take advice at that stage. On the other side of the coin, Stuart, what top tips do you have for companies who feel unable to fulfil their contracts? Okay, well, again, take advice and uh, consider the guidance that I just mentioned so you fully understand your position. Check the contract. Is there a force majeure clause? Make sure you comply with the notice procedure set out in the clause and make sure it's served also correctly in accordance with the notice provisions, which will be another boilerplate somewhere else in the contract. A lot of people make that mistake. They send an email, for example, where you are not allowed to send a notice by email. It has to be by way of first class post or hand delivery or whatever. So that's a very easy way to get caught out. But rather than just being difficult and saying, we're just not going to accept your goods or put a block on it, work with the other party to see if any agreement could be reached in relation to a partial fulfilment or a suspension or a delay. Because as I've said already, um, all parties may be looking for a solution and that conversation could be to everybody's uh, benefit. Finally, Stuart, if people need advice on commercial contracts, who can they contact at First Fields? Okay, so um, I'm a contracts lawyer. I'm a non-contentious lawyer. That means I don't uh, uh, have to don a wig and gowns anymore and go into the judge. Um, but I will write a contract or I'll advise you on your rights and responsibilities under the contract. So uh, my name is Stuart Price. Um, you can email me at sprice at thirstfields.co.uk or uh, well, my direct telephone number is 0121 227 3371. If the matter is uh, more contentious in nature, you're welcome to speak to me in the first place, but it may be that I would refer the matter to my colleague, Stephen Rome, who is a commercial litigator. Stuart Price, uh, a director at Thursfield Solicitors and an expert on commercial contracts. Many thanks for taking part in Thursfield's Taught Legal. Thanks very much for having me.
hopefully what Stuart had to say about commercial contracts is something that people will find useful. We'll be back soon to talk to more legal experts here at Thirstfields about other interesting aspects of the legal world. Thirstfields Taught Legal. Thanks for listening. Thank you.